Welcome to today's episode of the Black Sales Professional. I'm your host, James M. Fields. Now, before we get started, in this episode of the Black Sales Professional, this is part two of the series in which we discuss the three reasons for a lack of diversity in tech sales. In this episode, however, I briefly recap what was discussed in the first, but I give the roadmap or the path to greater diversity in tech sales. And I'll be doing that right after we hear from our sponsors. Now for the sponsors of our show today, we have the McDowell Brothers, two young men, Grant, recent graduates of Homeworth Lossmore High School. What makes these two young men so special is the fact that they recorded their first album entitled Tribute to Inspiration while attending Homeworth Lossmore Community High School. You can find and listen to the rest of the album on, a, on their website, which is located at mcdowellbrothers.bandcamp.com forward slash releases. McDowell Brothers, spelled M-C-D-O-W-E-L-L Brothers, dot bandcamp, dot com, forward slash releases. Our other sponsor for today's show is JMF Financial Services Incorporated, a local insurance agency that specializes in both group and individual health insurance products, disability insurance, or protecting your income, life insurance, and other ancillary services or product insurance products such as cancer, critical illness, accident, and hospital indemnity plans. You can also obtain uh, travel insurance as well as international medical insurance from them. They can be reached by calling 708-781-1603. That number again is area code 708-781. 1603, and their website is www.jmf-financial.com. That website again is j www.jmf-financial.com. Now back to our show. Hi, welcome. This is James, owner of Personalized Auto here in Kansas City. Personalized Auto. It's a super house of affordable pre-owned luxury vehicles. We're aimed at the first-time buyer and those with marginal credit without sacrificing superior buyer experience. So come on down to 6102 Merriam Drive in Merriam, Kansas, and ask for me, James. The experience you want, the savings you deserve. Personalized auto. Welcome back. If you recall in our the first episode, which was released on Monday... I discussed three reasons for a lack of diversity and inclusion in tech sales. And those three reasons were fear, lack of experience, and financial risk. I went into depth on each one of these areas. And so today, in this episode, I'm going to give you the path or the roadmap to get beyond it. Because we have to move forward. We can't just stand still and not have more people of color in technology sales. And so the first thing, well, the first step is to have a plan. According to Alan Lakin, failing to plan is planning to fail. And that's most important in this process. You're going to build a plan. And I'm going to walk you through how to build that plan so it becomes a plan for success. The first thing, we want to start with the end in mind. So, as with anything, you know, you, you build or you start designing something 
with what the end goal is going to be. So you want to start with the end mind in with the end in mind. And so in overcoming your fear of uh, and uh, the fear obstacle, there's three things that you want to do. First is we want to build a network of decision makers. Then we want to join associations or groups, I shouldn't say and groups, and gain business and industry knowledge. And now I'm going to discuss each one of those components in more depth so that you get a full understanding of why it's very important to do this, right? So for example, we want to build a network of decision makers. Now, we the reason we're doing this whole going through this whole process is because the the fear component comes out of the executive or senior management of sales having a concern or even the sa- the actual hiring manager having a concern for whether or not people will buy from you because when you're selling in technology or technology sales typically the companies are larger companies um, have larger revenue dollars and so the decision makers or share uh, stakeholders tend not to look like people of color like us and so because of that fear factor of having a per of them not being sure whether or not a person um, is going to be willing to buy from you we're going to try we're going to structure a process that's going to take that off the table and make it so that that no longer becomes an objection now the whole process is to remove uh, these objections as you learn you're going to learn if you have if you do not have sales experience the whole concept of of sales is understanding that buyers have objections some of the objections they will tell you up front they will be they will be um, open and honest about their objections but they'll tend to hide or keep certain objections to the very end of the process and those are the final objections that you have to overcome in order to get the sale well when it comes down to this process of being hired fear is that objection that they're not going to disclose they're not going to sit across the table from you and tell you that they're concerned that the individuals in the territory that they're going to put you in are going to buy from you because of the fact that you're either African American or that you're a person of color that's going to be that that's that objection that's kind of hidden or clo- or held close to their vest and they don't want to disclose it because of being viewed as of course as being racist or being discriminatory but the reality behind it is it's still there and so we have to attack it and address it and take it off the table so that it so that it can't be something in the back of their mind that they still hold to and of, uh, of questioning we're going to make it so that there's not an issue of whether or not the person's going to buy from you we're going to make it so that they're going to then be willing to be saying we need to hire this person because of the because of the background that they have the knowledge that they have and the people that they have around because they can they we're not worried about whether they're going to buy from us because because this individual is so well uh is well connected in the person and they're going to be and they're going to want to tap into your actual network and now for this example i'm going to use two components i'm I'm going to use an example of selling uh student information systems okay and there's two different markets that you can sell student information systems to you can sell them to the K through 12 market space or you can sell them to higher ed both of them come across both of them are student information systems we're going to use that as an example because you know it doesn't matter whether or not the industry is um, you don't have to do this 
for say, okay, I'm just going to go and sell uh, only to student sell student information systems. This is applicable for any type of technology sale that you want to use. The first thing you want to do is find the decision makers for that particular uh, product and you know in the business and then you want to build a network for this now when i first started back in the nine mid 90s back in 96 and then when i got into technology sales in 1997 with um with simplex we didn't have there wasn't a google there wasn't a linkedin so when I was going through the interview process, I didn't have the ability or the knowledge to be able to do this. But because technology has advanced and because we have systems like LinkedIn, you're now able to actually do this research, build a network before you even get to the interview so that you have a network of people and I'm going to tell you explain to you why this is important when I was moving from major account sales in a at ADP to national account sales I was competing for a position called public sector uh, district manager so I was going to be responsible for selling to the public sector all accounts of over a thousand employees or higher so basically that meant Chicago Public Schools, Cook County, State of Illinois, all the other district, uh, school districts with over a school, school districts with over a thousand employees in Illinois and nine other states. So when I met with the, with my the sales director who was hire, who was the hiring manager, I went on to explain to them my background, in public sector one of the markets that they really wanted to focus on was the K through 12 space well I had an advantage within the K through 12 space my mother was a 30 year educator and not just any type of educator she wasn't just a teacher when I was in high school my mom was high school principal later on my mother and at the time in which I was interviewing for this position, my mom was an assistant superintendent of one of the largest school districts in the state of Missouri. And she had relationships with other administrators. But more importantly than that, she gave me the ability, I had a person that I could talk to to tell me all of the ins and outs of schools and how they operate and what I need to do and this and that and what have you and so when I had that conversation with these with the hiring manager that was one of the stories that I shared and it gave me the advantage in getting that opportunity and getting the opportunity they still they were they were always going to bring me into national accounts but I had two short two jobs in which two positions that they were looking at trying to fill and this position when I told them that story I fit very well on that in that position so know who you know can help you get a get into a position because of your not the knowledge you know about that particular industry and having access to the problems and situations so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this uh, from a K through 12 standpoint first and as you can see from the diagram um, for those of you who are seeing the video um, the student information system is the software system that we're going to be that you're going to be finding all the stakeholders for and then you're going to track the various school districts within a geographic area and now even though some of the some of the territories for what you may sell may be may span multiple uh, states you don't necessarily have to uh, build a network of administrators throughout the entire country you want to concentrate 
your network on the small geographic area uh, or geographic area around where you are and you want to get the most influential of school districts um, to be to build your network now when you look at it so you're gonna find the names of board members superintendents um, curriculum academics um, business man the business manager finance human resources and information technology and you want to try and build a network of connecting through LinkedIn with these individuals and you're going to do that for on the K through 12 side if you're looking at the higher education market space then you're going to look at the various deans and you're going to expand that and you're going to have public safety housing financial aid information technology human resources business managers and finance academic affairs student affairs board and the, and then the board of trustees for that particular university as well as the president so and the provost so you're going to want to build a strong network of individuals that you have connections with most of the time, you know, public safety, you're probably not going to deal with a, These are influencers. You're, you know, uh, the financial arm, the IT are very, are going to be very, very important. Um, as well as some of the other executives uh, within, within the college and within uh, the K through 12 marketplace. But what you want to do is get yourself a a net will build a network of individuals that you can connect with and establish a relationship with and even thought leadership for because the next step after you developed the 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 action the um after you developed your network then what you're going to do after that is you're going to join and engage in associations some of these groups and associations are going to be online others face to face so once again back in the 90s and early 2000s we didn't have this technology we didn't have access to LinkedIn to where we could build and find people to uh, to market to you know LinkedIn at the time when it did was created it was mainly used as a recruiting tool it's a place that you built your profile and headhunters would recruit would look for you and then they would recruit now you can do all kinds of things profile uh, prospect off of it etc and even communicate and build a following so that it is the business at uh, business side of like Facebook so Facebook is the social um, LinkedIn is the business uh, social media outlet so you can create a voice and a following on LinkedIn you can do the same thing on Facebook when especially with certain types of industries most of the time business is face is LinkedIn and Facebook is more on the social side but so you want to find the LinkedIn groups and that are going to that your stakeholders are a part of so if you are calling upon say human resources and payroll you want to find the LinkedIn groups that deal with SHRM and other HR and payroll related um, issues then you want to find local associations such as I'll give you the example you utilizing um, the idea of selling student uh, information systems you're going to look at say for example in Illinois look to join the Illinois Association of School Administrators that's one aspect um, however what you're going to find especially in the education marketplaces you'll find all of these different small association groups some of them meet online some of them meet face to face in person but you want to look at some of them and participate and join those group join those groups you want to find and join and become active in the groups in which the biggest 
or the majority of your stakeholders of that particular solution that you've decided that you're going that you want to sell um, are a part of. Now let's take a, a quick step back. The whole purpose behind this is, you, you know, you're going to have multiple options. So you should not just say, okay, I'm only going to look at selling a student inf student information systems, unless that you know that that's the only thing that you want to do. But let's say you want to ultimately sell to, to, to schools, you like the school technology, and your ultimate goal is to become, is to move into um, selling the ER and joining the ERP vendors such as Oracle or SAP. Because those are two, um, two major players in the large school arena. If you're selling financials, you may look at the same thing. Um, if you want to go into schools or education and sell the financial side, then that would be the market in which you're going to, the, the group of individuals that you're going to build your network off of. But then you're going to attend, after you've joined various LinkedIn groups, local associations, you want to attend local meetings and events, and you want to network. But one of the things that you, you're doing when you're doing this networking. Now, this is not, like I said, as you can see, this process is not something that takes place overnight. This is a plan that you're going to have to execute over a period of a couple of years. And so, yes, I said it, a couple of years. It's a strategy. And the reason I say that and, and I'm going to just pause for a second and, and, and kind of explain to you what I mean by why I say this is a strategy that's going to last for a couple of years is when I was looking to get into to sales, or I should say get into uh, software sales, I built a strategy. I ultimately wanted, to, I'd done research, and I had wanted to sell for Oracle or SAP. But I knew, even though I not, I had sales experience, but I remember the monumental task it was to get a job selling copiers. I had a very difficult time in the beginning. I, one company got all the way to the end, and I, I'll have to tell you it's a long story. It's kind of uh, interesting. It's, it's it's pretty pretty telling of the times back then. But I was given an opportunity, so I knew that I wouldn't be able to just send a resume to a headhunter and have the opportunity to sell for Oracle or for SAP. Or even at that time, you had Oracle, SAP, JD Edwards, um, and all kinds of different ERP vendors. They've since consolidated. So I put together my strategy, and my strategy was I started with Simplex. And then I moved to HR payroll to Sheridian. Now, mind you, I never moved from I didn't move from from Simplex to an uh, an a, to the number to the industry leader. I always moved to the two to the number two player. So I moved from Simplex to e labor selling an enterprise technology. So it was you know e labor we sold to really large companies. And then I moved over to Sheridian, where we sold to large companies again, and you know, a hundred to a thousand employees. The the customers we dealt with, for example, my largest uh, my, cl my the the clients I had uh, in Indiana that I took away from ADP was Teachers Credit Union, the largest credit union in the state of Indiana. Um, then I moved to ADP. Then I moved from within ADP, I moved from major accounts to national accounts. And when I got to national accounts, then I did have the opportunity. Oracle Headhunter called me and wanted to interview me and, to, and was talking to me about coming to Oracle. And that I made the, a big mistake with. I should have done it. I didn't. I'll come back and I'll, on another episode. I will explain to you what happened. But anyway, 
the whole purpose of what I'm saying here is I put together a plan and it was a long plan. My plan took me from 97 to roughly 2007. So 10, it was a, almost like a 10 year plan. And by the time I got the option, the opportunity to get to the oracles and the SAPs, but we're talking about going from a, an earn on target earnings potential of say, uh, starting at you know, 50,000 and getting to Oracle or SAP would have given me a salary of approximately on target earnings of probably about a quarter of a million dollars. So we're talking a huge difference in income. And so 10 years to get to that number, that, that level is not unheard of. It's not nothing, um, nothing crazy. So you're going to have to build a plan and you're going to have to work that plan over the course of the couple years. And this process, if you work it, will help you eliminate the fear objective or the, the fear obstacle that people are put that people that hiring managers have in their mind when they're looking at you and you have no sales experience and you are a piece uh, a person of color the next after you've joined and engaged in the associations because now one of the things that when you're with those in those local meetings you want to inquire it's your turn to learn so you the job is to meet people and learn and ask questions about what's going on, what their challenges are. So using the school as an example, you should be asking them what are the challenges with regards to their quote unquote student information systems? How are they doing certain things? You know, bring up bring up an article that you read that you may have read and ask them their opinion on it. So you want to study and then you want to go in and what you're doing is probing. These are all questions and and skills that as an uh, that as an account executive you're going to put into the practice in the actual role. You're going to AEs, sales reps, we go to trade and association groups. We sit down and we interact and we meet the various uh, stakeholders and we inquire we ask them how they're doing handling XYZ. We bring topics that are that are uh, or situations that we may have heard about or maybe read, reading about, and we ask them their opinions. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to put that into practice. You're going to start learning and become knowledgeable about things and about what's important to the uh, to that particular industry. You're, so you're going to now start gaining knowledge. You're going to identify challenges, problems faced by that group. You're going to find out how the various members tackle those various issues. Then you're going to start studying all the, the technology companies that deliver products and services into that particular market space. So if you're looking to become a to sell a, a student information system, you're now going to start researching all of the players, all of the companies that provide that type of technology, Blackboard, uh, Baud, I mean, uh, whoever it is, all the different school, all the different systems that are out there, okay? You want to start, um, you want to start studying them and understanding how they're perceived by those those stakeholders in the group. Hey, if you if they use quote unquote SunGuard, hey, you know, you use SunGuard. Oh, tell me about it. What's your experience been? Blah 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 boom. And now you're learning, and you're gonna put all bring all that information, keep all that information because you're going to use it to your advantage when you when it's, when the time is right. You're gonna strategize. How you're going, you're going to build a strategy, I should say, around how you would market to those various organizations and companies. And you're bu just building your entire plan this entire time. So once you've done that, 
you're then going to overcome the lack of experience. Now, that's the second. That was the next challenge. Remember from the from the from the first episode, we talked about a lack of experience. And so we're going to tackle that. Now, if you do the things in this first part, this lack of experience is going to be minimized. And I and and I'll say that to say this, right? You'll be amazed what a hiring manager will be will think. They can teach you how to sell if you have the network. If you come to the table with the with the quote unquote as in the olden days the Rolodex and the influence of that Rolodex, so you're not just a name dropper, but you actually have the relationships or have some type of relationship and conversation with the individuals in um, in that space, the share, the stakeholders. A hiring manager will teach you how to sell. They'll do their best to get you into their organization, and uh, you'll be amazed that a lack of experience will not be a roadblock. Because I can teach you. It's kind of like playing basketball, right? I can, a coach can teach you all the skills of basketball but the one thing they can't teach you is height it's the same thing from this standpoint right I can teach you how to sell but the one thing I can't teach you is right off the bat for you to come to the table with a network that you can fully market and the knowledge around how you would actually sell to it so if you do the first part, you may not even need to, quote unquote, tackle the experience. However, gaining experience is always valuable. So while you're doing the first part that I just explained to you of your plan and executing upon it, you should also try and execute on the second part, which is gaining experience, because gaining experience it's just like if you're playing baseball and the more at bats you get, the better you are at hitting the ball. The more pitchers you see that throw different pitches, the better hitter you're ultimately going to be. And so gaining experience as a sales rep is definitely something that's going to help you. So in gain, in, in eliminating the lack of experience objection I'm going to recommend this three things number one get sales experience as a sales rep or if you have a technical background become a sales engineer and the third thing is become a va become valuable with your network and knowledge those three things will help you overcome the lack of experience. Now, a lot of people in their career pathing choose the route of an SDR or, in other words, a sales development rep. The, the challenge with the, sale, with the sales, uh, sales development rep is this, position is this. It doesn't really give you experience of selling. It helps you from a standpoint of prospecting, but it doesn't help you. That's and prospecting is, you know, if you talk to a hiring manager, they'll tell you, oh, the most important thing. If they don't have SDRs, they're definitely going to tell you, oh, you know, prospecting is the is the lifeline. You have to maintain a strong uh, strong uh, pipeline, and so prospecting is really really important. The real thing is not just prospecting, because yes, you have to find opportunities, but guess what? If you pick up the phone and you make enough phone calls and you have a decent pitch, you're going to find people that are going to be in the market to sell what the heck you're trying to buy. It's just going to happen. So the whole object, the thing is the SDR role teaches you prospecting. 
And now, if you're really good at being an SDR, then it's going to make sure that you have the necessary skill skills to maintain a strong pipeline. You're always going to be able to pick up the phone and get an appointment. And that's a great thing to have. But you got to understand that the bulk of the account executive or sales representative responsibility is not prospecting. It is once you have a prospect, moving them all the way down to the end, to the bottom. So if you're looking at the video, you'll see an illustration of a funnel. At the top of the funnel is the prospecting. You're putting all your prospects in. Now, when it comes down to being an SDR, that's where the SDRs come in. They pull in some. But even on the other side, the account executives. A good, a good account executive is going to do some prospecting. They're going to make, phone call, make some phone calls. They're going to attend um, e networking events and they're going to try and um, obtain more opportunities. But the other the other aspect of the account executive's role is they have to manage a sales process. So they have to take a person who's a prospect and move them down through the funnel. So qualified leads so they're qualifying a prospect some people are qualified some people are not the next stage is the initial sales meeting in which they're trying to understand and they have to run the initial sales meeting to try and gain more interest to move themselves down the, the funnel a little bit farther to get them to the analysis stage in the analysis stage you're trying to get them to a point where you're able to where they open up their entire processes to you and you're able to look at all their functions and how they do things and all of that good stuff and then you have the proof of concept now I said proof of, proof of concept as opposed to demonstration and there's a reason behind it a proof of concept is you've gone through an analysis You've told them, explained to them how your system is going to help them. And now you're just going to prove it through a demonstration. Then you get to the proposal and negotiations and at the bottom, a decision. And that decision comes out to be one of three things. A win, a loss, or a no decision. And depending on how well you've managed the process up top will determine whether it's a win, a loss, or no decision. And when you're selling software, the number one competitor that you have isn't the major competitor that you think it is. The other vendors that are out there. The number one competitor is no decision. That is the absolute number one competitor that you have to deal with. Status quo, a company not making a decision. And so that's when you're going through and the reason that you need to get experience is because the more at bats you have, the better you get. So the more uh, opportunities or sales processes you go through, the better you're going to be at the sale at managing the overall sales process itself. So get sales experience. You can do it from, like I said, you can do it from the SDR to outside sales. The one thing I want to tell you about going from an SDR to outside sales is this. Sometimes you have to be careful if you've never sold before and now you're going to go to be an SDR. The worst thing that can happen is for you to get in to be an SDR and you not make your quota. And I've been doing a little bit of research. There was a report. I think I saw it on Sales Hacker. And in that report, it stated that 50% of the SDRs don't make their quota. So you have to be very careful because if you're going to go down the path of the SDR and you're going to get in that role, it typically only lasts about 14 months. People usually will be in that role for about 14 months and then they're going to move on. But if you don't make your number as an SDR, if you're not making quota, 
a sales manager or a hiring manager is going to maybe be able to use that against you. So you got to be very, very careful about what you're the process, the path that you want to go to. So my suggestion is if, it, if number one, SDR is a very tough job. I mean, you're, you're prospecting, you're making phone calls, you're getting hung up on, um, people not avoiding you, all kinds of things, right? So that's not the fun part of the job. You also are stuck in an office maybe from nine to five because you're on a telephone. And so that's not the fun part of sales. The fun part of outside sales is being able to get out, meet people, um, work a flexible hours that you need to work in order to make your numbers and be productive. And so my suggestion is that you look outside of technology sales for your first job and you look at the industries that have a good track record of people uh, being successful and being able to move from those industries into technology sales and right off the bat I can think of three the three that I come up with are copiers small business security systems and payroll. Now, copiers definitely. Payroll is absolutely, but it's going to be the hard, it's going to be a little bit harder to get into. But the payroll industry, paychecks and ADP, for example, hired directly out of college. They're known for hiring people out of college, and you can work your way up from being a payroll rep in small business to being in major accounts, national accounts, and having the ability to go on to a company. Matter of fact, I have um, some individuals that I've wor- that I worked with that started in small business. Um, they were there in small business as a rep, then they went to be a small business manager, then they moved to national accounts for ADP, and they spent a number of years there, and then they moved to salesforce.com and they've been an AE at salesforce.com for well over 10 years very successful uh, matter of fact salesforce at a period of time used to acquire we used to go out and recruit sales reps from ADP from the payroll industry and so you can look at paychecks and you can look at ADP as two organizations that um, you can get sales experience they have base salaries Um, so, but they're going to be a little bit more difficult to get into. Okay. You have to have college degrees, um, copy your sales. You don't necessarily have to have a college degree, but I will say this. If you're going to look at going into technology sales, you probably need to have either a college degree or you need to be a, um, have one of the des- one of the certificate have some technical certifications behind you for technology. So if you have if you're Microsoft certified, if you're Cisco certified, something of that nature, then you probably can have an opportunity to get into technology sales because uh, the education may not necessarily um, may not be a factor. But for the most part, truthfully, you need a college degree in order to get into technology sales because you have to be able to talk business. And hiring managers are going to be very critical of your level of knowledge of business and P&Ls and cash flow and all of that and how their systems affect all of that in, um, without, a, without a college degree. It is just going to be a very tough sell. But copiers and small business security, B2B, is very important. That's what you want to deal with. You want to go into a sales role where you're selling B2B and you're not a demand creation person. So getting into being a manufacturer's representative is not a good thing because you're not selling to the end user. And you'll, and so what a hiring manager wants, that's not giving you that kind of experience in taking and managing a, a complete sales cycle to the end. So you want jobs that are going to give you that capability. Copiers are going to give you that capability. Um, small business uh, security systems are going to give you that capability of selling to small business, taking people through a quote unquote sales process and just getting the at bats that you need, the at bats that you need. And um, if 
you if it takes you a little while you're not necessarily knocking it out of the park but you're you're, you're building yourself up and making the and making your numbers and you get to getting to your quota then it'll be an easier move to get into technology sales because you'll have a track record in which to go ahead and do in your um, in which that you can lean on so the one thing I'll tell you about getting sales experience is stay away stay away from B2C and demand creation positions you definitely want to stay away from those because those are not going to give you the experience that you need when sitting across the table from a sales manager a hiring manager now they will maybe give you money so if that's the ultimate goal then okay but they're not going to help you when it comes down to sitting across the table in an interview and trying to to share how you've gone through and managed the sale pro sales process because if you're selling to an individual um, a consumer they're not going to look at it that in the same way because like I told you remember when you're selling to a consumer if they make a bad decision they don't have anybody to hold hold accountable hold themselves accountable to accountable to except for themselves but when you're dealing with business if they make a bad decision it can be a career ending or career hampering move so therefore the decisions are you know the the making the decision is a little bit more how do i put it um it's a little bit there's a little bit more risk associated with it the other aspect that you can a uh, way that you can get into to sales and get an experience is from the standpoint of a sales engineer being becoming a sales engineer and I mentioned in the beginning but let me explain to you what I really mean by uh, and why this is a benefit if you have a background in technology and software so you have um, a computer science degree or some other IT based degree or minor you have the ability and you're one and you're a wonderful speaker so if you can if you can present then and you understand technology you have the ability to to become a sales engineer as opposed to going down the path of the SDR you make more money you have more fun and you're there watching the what the account executive does. You work hand in hand with the sale with the with the actual um, account executive. And if you've uh, listened to the interview that I did with uh, my mentor Patrick Peterson, he went from operate from an operations side to a sales side. And and one of the advantages that the operations gave him was the ability of knowing and understanding the in depth aspect of all the systems. And so when you become a sales engineer, that's what you have. You have the in-depth knowledge of all of the systems. And so we've, if, in moving from, from a sales engineer to being an AE, it is a, it is a move that I've seen people make quite frequently and quite successfully. They've, able, they've been able to go ahead and do that and done a gr and and been successful w with doing it, and so um, you can do it at your pace. You can determine whether or not the AE role is really what you want, or maybe you just stay in the um, sales executive in the sales engineer role, and you have fun and and make uh, a really good living doing it. But don't discount becoming a sales engineer right off the bat. Look at it, explore it, and see if that's an opportunity that you want to that you want to go into. So, let's recap. Now, in the first episode, we spoke about the th like I said, the three different uh, reasons in which there's a lack of diversity in tech sales. There were fear, lack of experience, and there was a financial risk. And so, in these last, in this, during this episode, I've kind of explained, I've explained to you an idea, and giving you a role, giving you a plan. And if you execute upon that plan, that plan is going to provide you 
with the best opportunity to get a job in the tech sales, but it's going to take you a little bit. It's going to take some work because you have to, you have to overcome the objectives, the objections. And the way that you overcome those objections is by having work product. And even if you have never been in sales, so for example, the first thing you want to do is you want to build your plan, right? Identify the type of software that you would like to sell and give yourself a couple options. Do some research. Hey, if you, if you want to get into, um, if you want to be in finance, look at the financial software that's out there. If you want to get into, like I said, school systems, look at that. If you want to get into sales enablement, look at that. If you want to be CRM, look into that. Um, but build a plan and start the plan with the end in mind. What ultimately you want to do or be. And then put steps in place to help you get there. Now, the other thing that you're doing that I suggest that you do is build a network. Because you want to have the ability when it's time to interview. Number one, you want to be able to drive the interview. You want to be able to walk in the door and have and say, you know what? Pick up the phone and call the the vice presidents of of sales or the higher um, or sales executives of various companies and tell them that you would like to start having a conversation with them. Oh, I digress for a second because there's another way of actually beginning a, uh, an interview process. When you're looking for a particular job, just like in sales, there's a situation where in sales, companies send out requests for proposals. That is comparable to a company putting together a requisition for a sales position. Understand this. There are a lot of sales positions that get filled without ever going public, without ever a requisition being publicly published. So, what do you mean, James? What I mean is this, just like RFPs, you know, there are situations when you're, when you're selling to a company and they're going to go put out an RFP, you don't want to be the one to see the RFP and respond to it. You want to be the one on the front end that put together the RFP and the requirements and develop the RFP. Because at that point, you're in the driver's seat. It's your RFP to win. And so, likewise, if you do these steps and then you're and you and you gain this knowledge, you have decided that and upon your research, you figured out that the best company, the top companies for you to work for are X, Y and Z. Now you can contact the sales organizations of each one of those organizations and you now become the sales driver, the driver of the sales process. Because when you start meeting with them and you have your Rolodex or of, or network of decision makers, you know the pains that the organizations have and you've identified and studied and figured out which actual systems have the best opportunity to solve those problems and you can convey that to that VP of sales or that hiring manager and explain to them exactly how you would present their solution to your network of customers or network of potential customers and that you're just trying you're you're looking at this co- at their company and XYZ and X and Y company now you start having that that you take the the well I'm not worried about fear I'm their fear becomes something different their fear becomes do I lose this individual to my competitor now, you might not get in at the industry leader, the number one player, but then again, you might, especially if the number two player is really interested in you, because if the number two player is really interested in you, that number one player may take notice of it, but 
you have the ability to drive your recruiting process and play the and be ahead of the game as opposed to having a having to wait on a requisition uh, and a and a you know, on Indeed finding there's a job opportunity in X Y company. However, this process can work in that scenario as well because when you sit down with them and then you start you start turning changing the 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 actual questions around when they start asking you so do you have questions of us you can start asking questions of the organization and then you can start dis- describing how you can fit into that organization so if they tell you that the territory has been vacant for a while and they're really looking to to they need to fill it pretty quickly and need somebody who can ramp up right away now you have your network and you say, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Cus- Mr. Mr. So-and-so, I think I'm, I can help you with that because I have this network that I, of, and I am a member of, an active member of this group and this group in which these stakeholders are active members and I have established relationships with these individuals in which case I can reach out to them and present your value proposition As a matter of fact I've already spoken with with many of them and and have somewhat of an idea as to how, what their thoughts are within your about your system and that's why I reached out and why I'm applying for your organization Woo, game changer because I can guarantee you unless they're hiring someone from their competitor nobody else is doing that nobody else is doing it so, build your network of decision makers to take the fear of whether people do business with you off the table. You do this, they won't have they won't worry about whether or not they can make it whether or not a person's going to buy from you because they're going to know that these individuals are will, are willing to buy from going to be willing to buy from you or at least have the illusion that they are. Study the issues so that you can articulate that you are knowledgeable and what you can bring to the table and how you position their product and solution within the customers and if you can find out how the cut how your network views that particular company and how so that you understand how you would present it to them get sales experience so that you can learn the sales processes and gain practice yes like Alan Iverson said it's about practice practice if you can if you have the technical background go the engineering path and use that to get yourself in front and working with the AEs on a more consistent basis so in conclusion if you follow this process if you use these plans that I've placed before you that I've shared with you you're going to see what you're going to see if you when you sit back is that I just walked you through what you would do as a sales rep or as an AE yourself in a day to day job. I just gave you the tools or the process that you can of the information that you should gather, maybe not necessarily in the format. We didn't go through drills and things of that nature, but I gave you the roadmap that if you do those things now, you'll be in a position to actually, in an interview, tackle and overcome those various objections. Now, as of each time, if you haven't done so, please um, subscribe to, to the podcast, Black Sales Professional. You can do so at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. You can also view the video for this presentation so you can see the actual video material that I'm speaking to on YouTube on our YouTube channel and please give us some feedback put a contact, uh, a comment issue a review uh, or DM us you can DM me on LinkedIn or on Instagram J M field 1001 on Instagram until next time take care